What's up, everybody? It's John Morgan. Listen, I want to come to y'all and tell y'all right now where you can go and get your LYP merch, www.lypp.org. That's where you can get all the fly crew necks like the one I got on right now. You're going to get your hoodies, your hats, any type of product that we sell in that LYP, you have to go to the website to get it. You can't go to Amazon or no, no third-party company to get our products. You got to go to www.lypp.org right now to get all of this latest stuff lyp you can also get information on the pod new information on the episodes that we got dropping anything lyp related go to that website right now lypp.org peace Welcome everybody to another episode of the Lead of Purpose Podcast. I'm your host, John Morgan Jr. Listen, I have a, a special, special guest with me today, man. You know, uh, for those who've been following LYP, one of the things that I love to do is I love to sit down with my elders, man, and, you know, really get some wisdom poured into me. Um, and this man that I have with me is a, is a true definition of an OG. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we, we got Pastor Kenneth Paramore in the building, man. Thank you for having me, sir. Man, thank you for having me. I appreciate you. How you feeling? I feel pretty good. How you feeling? I am wonderful. In this season, um, I'm, a, I'm a little tired. You know, I got a newborn, you know what I'm saying? Three-month-year-old. I also got a two-year-old. Uh -huh. You know, so the house is rocking right now. You know what I'm saying? So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a lot going on, but it's a, it's a blessing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, listen, I want to I wanna really kind of dive into your story as a whole. You okay. know what I'm saying? And kind of just lead up to, you know, some of the things we got going on. But before, before we even do that, Listen, we are on the heels of the unfortunate tragedy of Jalen Walker here in the city. Last week, I sat with some pastors right here in these seats that you're in right now. Um, and one of the things that I like to do in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of turmoil, again, is talk to my elders, but also, you know, really want to try to be intentional on tapping into my faith and tapping in with God and sure. tapping into my sure. spiritual leaders. You know what I'm saying? So what's your perspective when we, when we see things like that happen? You know, things that are really unexplainable. You know, how do you wrestle with that being a man of faith, you know, a, a, a leader, you know, in, in the community, a black man, a father, you know, you know what I'm saying? Being being an elder. How do you how do you wrestle with all of that? Man, first of all, let me say it's wrong. Um, there's no explanation for it. There's no justification for it for what happened to Jalen to happen to him. Mm -hmm. And to happen to him, we're supposed to have checks and balances. It's, it's wrong, it's sinful, it's inhumane. Uh, and, and to try to explain it adds insult to the injury, not just to him and the fam his family, but to the whole community. Let me tell you how I feel about it by saying this to you. If I live to see next month, all this night I'll be 56 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm 56 years old. I don't have a criminal record. I've never been arrested. I've never been to jail. I pay my taxes. I'm a homeowner. And I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor in the city for over 30 years. But when I see the lights behind me, I still get nervous. Because mm -hmm. I'm black. Mm -hmm. That ain't went nowhere. Mm -hmm. I'm heavily degreed, I'm educated, all that kind of stuff. But when I see them lights, or not even the lights, if I see one pulling behind me, I know they're running plates and all of that. And I'm saying as a cat who has done nothing wrong, who doesn't have a criminal record, there is something monumentally wrong with our system when it can make an old cat like me still nervous. Mm -hmm. So then, my nerves are heightened right. for you, right. for Kenny, right. for just all of the fellas that I know that I've watched come up. Right. I'm nervous. Right. I say every time they walk out of the house, y'all be careful. Y'all be careful. Y'all be careful. Because I'm nervous right. all the time. And, and, and so that's where I'm at with that. And, and, and I think that without any real checks and balances in place. And I've gone all day about policing never being for us anymore. Right. Always being for white landowners, right. historically. Mm -hmm. We've never been in that place. Right. Um, so just all of that, man, makes
makes my heart bleed, but it makes me so nervous because in my head and in my heart, I know another one's coming. Mm. Whether in Akron or Georgia or Arkansas or Buffalo or another one's coming. And I can see the prejudicial uh, uh, mentality behind it because they get taken into custody and we get shot and killed. Yeah. It's the story, it's the narrative we ain't making this up. Yeah. So that's kind of, that's, that's where I'm at. And I'm constantly educating my young people for safety, right? Mm -hmm. But you and me know we can do everything right, right. and right. still get shot. Well, and, that, and that's the interesting thing, man. The first thing that you did was speak to the anxiety of the experiences of a black man who ain't did nothing. Nothing. Right? Like, you know what I'm saying? That is that is part of our experience that white folks do not have to consider They'll at never, all. They'll never, you know what I'm saying? They'll never have to consider what that is like to even, you know, have a cross in my I ain't did nothing wrong, but still. Mm -hmm. You know, I still got to be on, on point. You know, that is a, those are the intricate details of the experience of, of a black person, especially a black man, mm -hmm. that, again, that people don't really understand. And that is the part that, like, that's the part of, you know, the oppressive system mm -hmm. that really, you know what I'm saying, that, that's the stuff that goes un unseen. You know, it ain't even got to be nothing about the overt stuff that you see and that you hear. It's the stuff that we wrestle with on a day-to-day, -day, day -day you know what I'm saying, that's just moving within, within our society. And, and I'm glad, John, you said the system, because it is systemic. Absolutely. It is absolutely, not just in the fabric of policing, but it's in the fabric of our country. Right. Right. And that is there. It right. is systemic. It's a part of the DNA. Racism is a part of the DNA of this country. That's it. Since it's yeah. inception. Come on. <laughs> Come since, on. since it's inception. And anybody not dealing with that, they are either insane or stupid. That's right. Well, listen, when I had, um, again, when I, when I sat down with the practice, I also had Dr. John Cooner. Shout out to Dr. John. Um, and, you know, we asked him the same same question. He said, one of the first things that I have to do outside of taking care of my mental health is I have to accept that this is a white racist system first. You know what I'm saying? I have to accept that. And that's the support of it. That, that's it, you know, and when we accept that, then that, you know, it, it allows us to understand, all right, what, what we do, there, there is nothing new, and unfortunately, it, it isn't anything new, and we know it's going to be another one, you know, um, and although that is depressing, and that is extremely sad, and nobody should have to experience that, that is the reality of where we are. But, but that's a part of what we call being woke, <laughs> you know, right. you, you can't be more woke than to know my wife is in jeopardy. Oof. Yeah. Every time I leave the house, yeah. this could go down. Right. My life is more in jeopardy as a black man than the police officers is as a public servant. Yeah, I got more of a chance getting shot than he does mm. or she does. Right, right. And that's just real. Right. That's the that's the statistic. Yeah. More than likely, they going home. Yeah. One of us. Ain't. So how do you how do you wrestle with those type of tragedies, those type of oppressive incidents? With your faith, like you know, what I'm saying, how do you, how do you settle on that with your faith? What type of mm -hmm. conversations are you having with God when it comes to things like that? Things that we just can't explain, and we know it's wrong. I always ask why. I'm not of the faith where I don't ask God why. I always ask why. I always ask how long. I always ask how come. But I'm also mindful of the fact that the things that are happening is not necessarily God as much as it is man. In humanity right. towards me. Right. Evil exists. Right. Evil exists, and, and people would have to choose the right thing. And because of what I believe about my faith, we're free moral agents. And as free moral agents, there are times when we are at the mercy of people who choose wrong. So let's put that in perspective there. I'm not just at the mercy of a police officer who will choose wrong. I'm also at the mercy of a drunk driver right. who will choose to drive. Right. Right. Or, or my children are at the mercies of drug dealers mm -hmm. who will supply a middle school or an elementary school. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Whatever somebody is choosing wrong, whatever somebody decides to walk on the opposite side of right, right. it puts us at risk. Right. And I understand that. now. 
what I love for God to just make everybody behave. Right. Yeah, but then we wouldn't be choosing him. Mm-hmm. And that's that conundrum. That's that wrestling match. That's that tension. Right. How come you won't make it stop if you can? Right. He says, I want you to choose me, but I didn't know people choosing you right now. Yeah. So that's that wrestling match. Yeah. And it hasn't made me so far, I'm grateful, want to quit on God, but it keeps making me ask him the questions. And one of my professors, Dr. Wendy Russo, used to teach us, you don't know you're growing because you have answers. You know you're growing because you got more questions. <laughs> right. Yeah, 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 that's good. Yeah, that's the word, I like, I like that. Yeah, I like that. But let's, take, take me back to the beginning, the childhood. You were originally from Youngstown, right? Born and raised in Youngstown. When you reflect on the childhood, <laughs> before Pastor Perry Moore, you know, the, uh-huh. the young dude come, coming up, What's some of those earliest childhood experiences kind of just stand out for you, man? I loved growing up in Youngstown. Mm. It, it, it's always been sort of a rough place. But I loved growing up in Youngstown, man. I loved my neighborhood. I loved my friends. I loved everything about growing up in a, in a working class steel town. Uh, I had both my parents. Uh, they were they were strict but fair, and they were hilarious. <laughs> you know, I mean, hilarious. Now, I'm gonna tell you look, to give you an idea to let you look. So it was five boys, okay, all boys, okay. My mom and my dad. Uh, just to give you some insight, my dad was five five, my mom was five t. Okay, all so right. In their wedding picture, my mom was sitting in the chair, he's standing behind the chair. <laughs> okay, all but right. My dad didn't play, and yeah. my mom didn't either. Right. So one of the things about having all boys, and I'm giving you a peep into strict, about having all boys, we weren't allowed to have multiple girlfriends, mm. multiple girls at the house. So if a girl would call the house, my mother would say hello, and they'd say the girl's name was Sally. Uh-huh. And she'd say, well, hey, Sally, said, can I please speak to Kenny? Yeah, you can speak to Kenny. Now, you know Kenny go and say, ah! <laughs> Mom ain't play that. Mom <laughs> Stuff like that. She was dying as I was. I was kind of hating it. We couldn't do it. Right. We couldn't do none of that kind of stuff. We couldn't play the games. It was, but, but we had to be home. We were supposed to, supposed to be home. So they were strict, but they were fair. And as I got older and had kids, I understood why they were strict. My family, my parents, were from the country. Mm. And so I had to explain this one time, man, when I was at Ashland doing my. Uh, Clinicals for counseling mm-hmm. over at Emerge. Mm-hmm. Some some Caucasian girl said that black people were abusive to their children mm-hmm. and was accepted. Mm-hmm. And I looked at the professor who was teaching them correctly, he never did, so I raised my hand. I said, We're not abusive. I said, It's more on the line for a black parent. I said, If we don't listen to our parents, we don't come home. We do lose our life. Literally. Literally. Mm-hmm. And they didn't understand mm-hmm. that. But my father coming up in Georgia, he has seen a couple of his friends hang from trees. He was born in 1928. He has seen people have to leave town because they got to fight with a white person. And my mother the same. And so when they told us to do something, to put something down, they were getting us before the other people got a chance to get us. Because if they got us, it wasn't going to be merciful. Yeah. And, and so, man, I understood it as I grew, but I had a great time growing up. I had a fun childhood for the most part. I loved to play outside every day. Um, it was just a good time, man. I don't have a whole bunch of bad memories about growing up in Youngstown, Ohio. God bless me to be decent in sports. I got a scholarship to come here mm-hmm. and ended up staying here. My brother, who's three years older than me, came here first. I came here to play ball, but that never worked out because I tore up my knee. But man, everything was just cool. So I've been, I've been really, really Youngstown's been good to me, which is why I went back and planted a church there mm-hmm. to try to give back to the community that gave so mm-hmm. much to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, th- despite everything that's going on, the church is under all that. It's just these little things that are nerve wracking to me. But I know a lot of my friends would love to have the situation I had. Right. 
So I try not to complain, uh, complain about that. But y'all sound so good for me. What did you, what did, what did you learn? What did, what's a couple of things you think you learned from your parents, man, that really like stand out to you today? You know, something that you really carry with you to today. One is faith, because we was broke. <laughs> so <laughs> you gotta have some faith, so, right? If you ain't got nothing but hope and faith when you, when you ain't got nothing to eat, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. They, they, they didn't give us a lot of money. Mm -hmm. We didn't inherit any property. Mm -hmm. Which I say to people who can change that for their kids, they should do that now. Right. Um, they were working class, blue collar people. My dad quit school in the third grade and had to go to work. My mother quit school in the eighth grade mm -hmm. and had to go to work. But they taught us how to love each other and they taught us how to have faith in God. And they gave us a good name. Right. And they demanded that we took care of their name. Mm. And, and so that kind of rested on me to stay out of trouble, to do what I was supposed to do. And it's, it's a blessing to have a good name. Yeah. It's a blessing to have a good name. It's a blessing to inherit faith and to know love and to know how to share it and receive it. And I think other than them being, they were just hilarious, funny people other than that, showing us how to love each other and not be embarrassed doing it. Right. Was super cool growing up, and I hold that now. Right, yeah. man. One of the you just spoke on, you know, really having empathy. You know, what I'm saying mm -hmm. for for your father and, and his experiences coming up in the deep south, and that's just they dealt with experiences that that y'all never seen. Oh. Obviously, you know, people in my generation never dealt with. But as I've gotten older and had children of myself, I understand the power of empathy for my parents mm -hmm. and my grandparents, but specifically my parents way more now than I, than mm -hmm. I ever did, you know? And I take that into consideration with how I judge them, mm -hmm. how I judge other people, you know, and just, you know, people go through stuff that we have no idea about. It'll, it'll make you think, won't it? Absolutely, it'll man. It'll make you think, man. Here's, here's the thing, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna blow your mind with this. I was in Philadelphia, I think, just a couple of months ago. I was in Philadelphia and I made a wrong turn. Simple. But I started reading the signs to find my way back. Mm -hmm. And then I got emotional because my father couldn't read. Mm -hmm. He quit school in the third grade. So he, 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 would, he could piece together stuff. As a matter of fact, we had to teach him how to read because he wanted to be a foreman in the meal. Wow. So the flashcards, I remember teaching my dad that because he really wanted the promotion. He got the promotion, but he wasn't, he couldn't really read. And I thought about how hard does it have to be for a cat leaving Georgia, right. moving to Ohio, right. and you don't even understand the sign. Right, right, right. So that's the kind of empathy I have for my parents. Just and, and just that the dude made it. Right. <laughs> you know, he made it. When do you think that you really, you know, understood that? When did the empathy really kick in? Do you think it was all, always there, or did it, you know, did it happen with you having your own family and things like that? That part kicked into me early when we were teaching me for uh, for the test he had to take in the steel me. Okay. When, when we were doing those flash cards and he was trying to piece those words together, and I remember I felt bad for him and proud for of him all at the same time. Right. Bad for him because he had to quit so young right. and take care of his mom and his sister. Right. Proud because this cat, uh, my, my, my mother said, I could see him to a class. He said, no, nah, I'll just let my boys teach me. Mm -hmm. They know how to read. So he wasn't embarrassed. Right. So we had to dine on the table and I was, we fun. Mm -hmm. I bet you I get the next three. Right. I bet you. So he turned it into this game right. and he wasn't there. So, that little dude was 10 feet tall to me. Yeah. To embrace that and not run from it right. and conquer it was major for me, which put it to us, we can probably do anything. Right. right. <laughs> he, was, he was really building your confidence. Oh, man. Oh, man. Yeah. So, so that's kind of, and then as I got older and started having kids and things like that, then I understood the sacrifice of just them two trying to feed and clothe five right. giant boys. Right, right. That was amazing. 
on the well on the flip side of empathy, right? Empathy usually has to deal with some level of pain. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So was there any was there anything that you learned from your parents that you was like, you know what? That was my experience, but I want to make sure that I teach my kids a little something different because my parents they weren't able to you know to be able to do that. So was there anything that you learned? That you were like I want to do something a little bit different with mine. I I wanted to make sure with my kids that they understood why I needed them to be right. Ooh, break that down. See, my parents were old school, so you know you need to do right because I told you. <laughs> point blank. Yeah, point blank. <laughs> we explained it, Doctor. Right. Man, look, if you ask our, our parents why, God, yeah, no. yeah. That, you know, that, you get your head knocked right. off, right. you know, told off, all that kind of stuff. So the thing that I wanted to do was I wanted to make sure my kids had knowledge of why. I wanted to explain to them why. I wanted to explain to them why I was protective and why I was concerned because my parents didn't deal in why. And, and that was the part I wanted to improve upon. They were great providers. We had everything we needed. Um, but that piece right there, I, I wanted to make sure I could explain because I, I felt like I would have did better mm -hmm. if I would have knew the why. Right. And then just some of the stuff I learned about my dad, man, my dad passed away in 2016 mm -hmm. at 88 years That's old. Yeah. So some of that stuff came out when he was 82. Right. <laughs> he was about to leave. Right. And he dropping stuff on me right. about the family, just giving me the why as he's getting ready to exit. Right. And I didn't want that for the kids. So that's that. That's the thing that changed. We need to really make sure they had an understanding. I mean, that's so that 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 is so so real. Listen, I got my little boy is two mm -hmm. and. Everything is wide with him, right? You know what I'm saying? But here's the thing, right? I still kind of come up, you know, my mom, my mom was really very much old school. Mm -hmm. you know, grandparents from mm -hmm. a certain type of cloth, it, it was just. Because I said so. If I said so, that's what it is. As a matter of fact, you don't even ask me why. You don't even have no right to ask me why. Period, period point, point blank. Saying why was equivalent to a customer. Exactly. Yes. So yes. as my as my two year old says why to me, Sometimes viscerally inside of me, hey, I'll be like, bro, stop, you know, I'll be wanting to go there. But then what you just said, I also want to communicate with him to get him to understand, especially why he's young and, and he's so impressionable. He's so, he's really very wise. Mm -hmm. So I really just want to be able to plant a certain type of seed, increase his confidence, and so he can really understand the, you know, the importance of what it is I'm telling him. Because he's a lot smarter than I think. So I'd be really happy to check myself more than I gotta check him. But I still be dealing with that, bruh. I be wanting to tell him, man. Let me tell you something, John. Your son is two. Yes. He knows how to work a smartphone. Right. Yes. You were at least 16. Right. Before you ever had a right. phone in your head. Right. right, right. So he at least got you about 14. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. It's, it's, it's really more than that, because he knows how to do certain stuff that I never. Yeah. Even, his, even his form of communication is just. I'm like, where did you learn that from? They're, they're brilliant. I'm like, man, where did you get that? And I don't think we can get away with it because I said so. Ooh. We can't. Ooh. And, and, Ooh. and Ooh. even if even if they respect us enough to act like it, yeah. we don't want them learning the why somewhere else. Yeah. Because that's what I did. Right. And man, my friends didn't know what they're talking about. Right. The people didn't know what they're talking about. I got in all kind of trouble because like other people was explaining right. the why. Right. So so yeah, so. Again, man, the fact our, our kids won't take because I said so because they got too much information yeah. in the palm of their hand. Yeah. Yeah. Something I envy about y'all is how y'all able to stay in touch. This is going to make you laugh. I went from Youngstown to Akron mm -hmm. to go to college. Mm -hmm. That's 47 miles from the campus to the front door where I grew up. Lost touch with everybody. Wow. It was like they got raptured. Mm -hmm. I never saw, I never heard from them. Because we didn't have that. Right, right, right. But I'm, I'm watching Kenny and y'all stand in touch and they on the, on the other side of the country. And that's amazing. Yeah, you know, you know, can hold the relationships together. That's just super cool. Man. Yeah. No, it, it is. It, it shrinks the world. Come on. Man. And that's what I'm trying to say. Right. So for your son, I had never been more than two or three miles outside of the block I grew up in. 
Your son has the whole oh, world. Oh man. Oh man. That's a that's a that's a that's an amazing point because the to, whole world, to him, he's not gonna deal with the same type of fear of like mm -hmm. what's out there. You know what I'm saying? He ready to go. He ready to go, oh, man. And it's yeah. not it's not gonna be too much for him at all. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He see he sees it. You know, LA yeah. don't seem across the country to him, you know what I'm saying? That don't a different continent don't seem like much to him. Bro, I, could, I just seen somebody in Africa doing this on, you know. Come on, I can do this. Right. I can do this. Right. right. I never seen any of that stuff. So I was afraid to go to Ohio State. Mm -hmm. I was afraid to go to Memphis State. I was afraid to go to Central Florida. These are all colleges that recruited me and offered me full scholarships because I had never been anywhere. So I was, when I got off the plane, I was like, I just feel like I'm way too far from home. Right. Your son will never have that problem. Right. Because you don't have it. Right. 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 Little Kenny, Brittany, my oldest daughter in Columbus, uh, they, they ain't got no fear of going nowhere. Right. This right. dude is on the other side of the country. Yeah. Told me, I ain't yeah, know this thing all. too. Right. <laughs> right. 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 I ain't know. I missed you, Bob. I missed you. Right. 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 Yeah, you yeah, know that's real. That, that's real. So, so that's that part that why I, I felt like I needed to answer because I didn't want them getting the why from people who didn't know as much as I knew, right? Good or bad, right? Does so that make sense? It does. It yeah. make it make it makes perfect sense. So when you do come to Akron, you play. You say you tore tore your knee playing ball. Mm -hmm. Like, what type of what type of transition? Like, how hard was that transition for you? For like. <laughs> being done with sports to try to figure something out and trying to survive. Because the reason I ask that is because, listen, when I got done playing basketball and out of high school and I realized that going to college, that it just was, it just evaporated overnight. Man, that was a super hard transition because so much of my identity have been wrapped up. Ball. Oh man, I watched you play ball. That's how people knew yeah. who I was, uh -huh. right? It was like, was, was playing sports. So when that was gone, Man, the confusion happened, you know. The, people don't know that. Oh, man. Those you don't have to be in the NBA for that. No, 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 no. Mm -mm. I came up my whole, my whole life playing sports. That was, that was the way that I seen, I, I identified what success could look like or mm -hmm. would look like. Was What's through this? Yes. This is what gave me my, my, my swag, my cachet, my popularity. So when that was gone, I struggled with the transition and got caught up in a lot of stuff because of that. So... How was that for you, you know what I'm saying, back in the day, just dealing with that transition, knowing that ball is no longer there for you? You put me on the spot. <laughs> That's what we're here for, man. You know? That's what we're here for. So when I tore up my knee, um, I flunked out of school mm. with a point nine grade. Ooh. Not a one point nine. Point nine. Do a point nine grade. So you really just weren't showing up to class. I know, I know what that's like. I was sitting in that room with, with my knee bandage, <laughs> watching the young the wrestlers. Yeah, yeah. And I would hobble over to uh, Robinson to get something to eat. And I, I really believe, John, had I not met Lita, my wife, mm -hmm. I'm sure I wouldn't have went back to school. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I wouldn't have went back to school. I was, I was depressed. I understand what you're saying. I was depressed. I felt like I was going to make it. I felt like I had a shot at doing something. Um, and then when that was gone, man, it depressed me. I just stopped going to class. Yeah. And I flunked, I flunked out of school without, I'll never forget when I flunked out, I asked my mom if I could borrow a car to come up to the university after she told me off. She let me use the car, I drove up. I met with a cat named Dean Marion Rubo. He gone now. He was an older Jewish cat. I came in. What can I do for you, Mr. Mary? I said, you got to let me back in school. He said, I ain't got to. I don't have to do anything. Right, right. You know, I don't have to do anything for you. Clearly, you don't want to be a student. You went down that road. Right. Why should I let you back in school? I told him, I'm from Youngstown, Ohio. I'm not going to the armed services. And I'm afraid I'm either going to kill somebody or somebody going to kill me. And I was crying in that dude's office. And he sat back and he looked at me. He said, I don't know why I'm doing this. But something is telling me you're going to help people. Dean Marion Rubo let me back in school with my scholarship. He didn't take it from me. I went from being kicked out of school to the dean's list. That's how I got my, my second chance. So is that one of the first times that you can point to 
where you knew God intervened and just sure. like just sure. pat his hands on you, cut cover you. For sure. And, and at that point, I knew I had a calling, right? But I wasn't answering it because I was trying to be the man, right? And so uh, I flunked out. I thought it was over. And that Jewish dude, that old Jewish man, said those words to me and led me back to school. And that's where I started turning it around. Mm -hmm. That was one of the first times. The first time God did that for me was in high school. So in high school, I was a good kid. Um, exceptional athlete, good kid. And I have a great memory. So literally, I would sit in class and listen and take my tests. I didn't do homework, didn't do none of that stuff. So I was rolling with like a two point grade average. I flunked English. They put me in honors English because I, I passed this aptitude test. And I didn't want to go with that. Maybe though I flunked English. So it's time to sign. And John got a 1.9999 grade average. Mm. I can't sign my scholarship. Mm. My coach said, Come with me to the principal's office. What's wrong? What's, what's going on? Yeah, well, Ken here, you know, fuck the English. And back then, you only did three years of English. I had that. I had missed the 10th grade year, but I had the other three years. And so he said, and you're supposed to sign today. It was Valentine's Day, 1984. I never forget. He said, hold on a second. This cat, a white dude, picked up the phone and said, I got student numbers, so and so and so and so and so and so in my office. Uh, Mr. Trafficking was his name. And he said, it's an F on his transcript that shouldn't be here. Thank you. Um, that's how I got the cop. That's real, man. That's how I got the cop. That's he <laughs> makes a call, tells him to take the F off. I go from 1.9 to like 2.1, 2.2. I sign. I get to college. I didn't learn from that. I messed up again, flunked out again. Right. And that's when I heard the Lord say, I will take everything from you if you don't straighten up. I'll take it all. And so I never really drank or got high and that. I was just kind of belligerent and lazy. You know, just doing my own thing, man, ignoring the call of God on my life, you know, um, fooling around with girls and stuff like that, but nothing really heavy, just enough. And see, that's how, that's how life got me. I wasn't doing nothing heavy, just enough to detain me. <laughs> right. No, I'll talk about it. Yeah, talk about it. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing that's going to get me arrested or anything like that. Just enough that you won't be who you're supposed to be. That's why. And I'm that's all it takes. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. It can be a split second. Just, it don't got to be anything in your control. Just doing all the stuff that you don't need to be doing so you can't make it. That's what I was guilty of. That's real, man. That, that's real. So a, a lot of cats will think, are you drinking, are you smoking, are you doing this, are you doing that, are you selling, are you doing Nah, I just was lazy, yeah. belligerent, and taking for granted all my opportunities. Yeah. I ain't do nothing. So it don't have to be the other stuff. You, you, can, you can implode just doing stupid stuff. Yeah, that's all, that's all, that's all it takes. And I mean, going back to what we said at the beginning, you know, when you're dealing in this system, a lot of times, man, you can be a victim, you know, of, of oppression. You know what I'm saying? Especially when you mess around if you ain't if you ain't on point. If you ain't on point, if you ain't locked in, you know. Check this out, man. I, you know, so I told you I went to a school in Youngstown, Ohio. I graduated from V. Rand High School. Mm -hmm. So I graduate. I'm in my first class. The government politics in the U.S. Lita was just laughing about the story. Government politics in the U.S. Dr. Lieberman was the uh, uh, teacher. This cat sounded just like the Cabo Ferris Bueller's down. Bueller, Bueller, <laughs> Bueller. Yeah, he sounded yeah, just yeah. like that dude. Yeah. And so I'm in class and I'm sitting like this. Uh -huh. Everybody in there is white. Mm -hmm. Except for the girl behind me and me. And so, trying to shoot this, she said, not on my shoulder. I said, hey, what's up? I'm thinking she want to talk to me because I'm full of myself. Ah, <laughs> yeah. She said, <laughs> what's happening? She said, what's up, girl? What do you mean? <laughs> she said, uh, Aren't you Pimo's brother? That's, okay. That was her nickname. Not Pimo. Okay. Okay. Aren't you Pimo's brother? I said, yeah. She said, um, you're not gonna write none of this down. Mm. I said, this? Cause I now I can retain this. It's life. It's life. Watch me work. It's life. She said, you probably need to write this down. So she pulled me shirt back, gave me a tablet, gave me an ink pen, and 
They said, write this down. That's my first college experience because I wasn't used to studying. I wasn't ready for college. So how many of us come out of high school and because the teachers love us and all that, they pass us and we're good and we're cool, but have no inkling about what it takes to be in college? Man, listen, you talking, man. When I was... <clears throat> I remember being a student, I had, listen, again, I told you, I struggled with the transition, you know, of not playing ball and going, going into school, you know, so I tried to just go to school because, again, after sports, school was the, the thing that felt the most normal to me. Mm -hmm. um, ended up flunk, flunking out of Akron U. I ended up going going to community college down in Canton at Star State. Mm -hmm. I'm messing up again, and there's a professor I had, little lady, short, short lady, Miss, Miss Riddle, and i never forget. It was the day before. It was, it was the day before um, winter break was about to take place, and I'm literally on the highway, getting ready to go to Columbus and go kick with my little cousin on Ohio State's campus. I never forget. This lady called me, John. Where are you? I said, Oh, well, I'm about to go out of town. No, 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 no. You messing up? Come back and get yourself together, and you will pass. Just like that, hung up the phone. I never, I never forget it. Why? I was literally, and I'm literally on my way to Columbus, about to get on the highway. I'm going to kick it. I'm going to party it. In my mind, I'm done with school. I'm yeah. going to rest out. <laughs> but in that moment, God intervened mm -hmm. and, and put a lady in my life who I liked, who I respected. Who you would listen to. And it's got to be somebody you'll listen to. And she had to say too much. Mm -hmm. But she said just enough, and it just resonated with me like, dang. Mm -hmm. Let me quit playing around, man. Let me let me quit messing up on myself, man. You know what I'm saying? Like even if I couldn't see the vision for myself, I don't want to let her down. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Now I got accountability, right? Because they're pouring into me. I got to pull this off. Bingo. Yeah, Bingo. you got Bingo. it. You got it. So when did so when did the calling of pastor come come about? And like, how did that? Were you were you raised in the church coming up? Oh. Like, what 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 was your you know? What was your experience with, with the church and just, you know, with faith and things like that coming up? Raised in the church, made to go to church. My mom and dad wasn't playing with it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had to leave football practice, basketball practice, every Tuesday at 5.30 to be at choir rehearsal at 6. And my mom told all my coaches, listen, you can do whatever you're going to do to y'all, but he got to go do what you're going to do for the Lord. Right. Because when y'all get tired of it, the Lord don't have it. Right. She would say that to the coaches, but I was like, she, she's killing me. Right. But she, so I had to sit in the choir, all that kind of stuff. I was 15, man, when I knew I was going to preach. I was out of youth for life. Mm. Uh, John Pinkney was preaching. He preached a sermon called It's the Real Thing. He was really talking about Jesus. He was the Coke of the old Coke uh, slogan. And man, I'm standing at the altar and I hear the Lord telling me, You're going to do the Lazy invitation. You're going to do this. You're going to do it. And I'm saying, No, I ain't. <laughs> no, I ain't. Do so I was 15 when I knew. So after that time, I just, I, I didn't, like I said, I didn't go off the rails. I was just trying to do everything not to preach. And it wasn't until I tore up my knee and all of that that I actually said, okay, you know what, I surrender. I surrender, I'm going to go ahead and do this. As a matter of fact, your father-in-law had me hemmed up in his office. <laughs> it, it was, we did something, uh, uh, we did power out. Okay. That was on Wednesday. 12 to 1. And Pastor Jeffrey Dennis, he had came to a gospel choir concert. So I was in a gospel choir. And they gave him the mic and I said some stuff. I don't even know what I said. But he said, hey man, let me holler at you. He got a call on your life. Mm. And I said, I know. Mm. And I started walking away. He said, hey, hey. You know how you do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's so all right. It's right. all right. It's all right. It's to me. And so he got me to come into his office. He sat me down. He started talking about the Lord. And I'm looking at my watch. <laughs> We <laughs> was downstairs waiting on me. I was hungry. I was I like, Joe, I just said, you know what? I accept my call. Mm. That's how I did it. He said, well, let me take you downstairs. You can be the pastor. And that's how I started preaching. He just wore me down. And I was really saying, okay, just to get out of his office. But that's what it took him to push me. If it were not for that conversation with Jeffrey Allen Dennis, I would not have accepted my call. Not that day. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out Pastor <laughs> Dennis, man. That's my guy, man. Shout out Pastor Dennis, man. That's what, that's what got me to do it. So how, how old were you at this time? At that point, I'm 20. That's a, he's still a kid, I'm man. I'm still 20. a kid. I'm 20. So, okay. So take me to the take me to the frame of mind of a young dude. What year was this? 
1987. March 4th, 1987. So take me to the mind frame of a young dude at 87, 20 years old, and you accept your calling. Like, what is the external pressures of, of, of that? Like, you know what I'm saying? Because you kept saying, I was trying everything in my power not to do it, but then you finally do it. So just take me back to the mind frame of like, why you didn't want to do it? You know what I'm saying? What was you What was you battling with externally? Like, man, I'm, I'm, I don't want to get this up. I really see. So let me let me tell you. When I came to University of Akron to give you an inkling, man, I was I was probably about two hundred eighty pounds. I ran like a four six. Okay, I all right. Bench press four hundred. Oh yeah, you was the man. Squat six. Yeah, you was the man. All that. I can I can still dunk a basket. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. I was really feeling myself, and okay. I thought I could probably do this football thing. Right, right. So in my head. I was going to do the football thing, and I told the Lord, and how arrogant is that, right? I told the Lord in a prayer, I'm going to holler at you after I do this. When I'm, when I'm done. And the Lord said, how about you don't do nothing? Oof. I take that away, <laughs> right? I take it all the way. Then what you going to do? Mm. And I, I still remember the final thing, uh, Sunday, Sunday before March 1st, we came to United to church. And me and Lita was in church. She was sitting by me. And uh, she got up to join church. And I grabbed her hand, and she snatched away from me away. And the Lord said, I will take everything and everybody from you. And so she went up, she accepted Christ. We came to the New Day service, and that's when Jeff hit me. Jeff hit me with the whole speech, but wore me down. And to me, it's no coincidence that I accepted my call on March 4th. Okay. Okay, March 4th. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So that's the day I accepted my call. And uh, so all of that was on me. So by the time I said yes, I was tired anyway. I was tired. I couldn't play ball. I was all I was 100 percent a student. And I did it at United. Now that, that was important because at United there was Pastor Pounds, there was Jeffrey Dennis, there were Michael Harrison. None of them were 35 years old. Okay, so they were young guys. All young, yeah. all suited and booted, mm -hmm. and they were all brilliant right. at what they did. Right. So now I'm seeing it was real for you. I could pull this off. Right. This is real now. Right. This, 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 this is something I can really make happen. And because of that dynamic, that just kind of, so it was easier to do then than it had ever been before because I was watching cats that was 60, 70. When I got my call, my pastor at my home church was 60 something years old. And so I was watching a bunch of old dudes and it didn't connect. But when I get up, and these dudes listen to the same music I listen to, but they preach. But they know the word. And I'm like, I think I can do this. So that, that was the part that resonated with me, that grabbed me. If they were not who they were, it probably wouldn't have grabbed me. Man, one of the <clears throat> one of the things that I've um, really grown to understand and learn and really empathize with, you know, from you know just having a relationship with my father-in-law, is like the amount of pressures that um, that pastors and leaders and churches, you know, what I'm saying, really go through. This constant. And when I when I really sat and like, first of all, I got an inward look at it, but then I just got to start to thinking. I'm like, number one, it's already just enough pressure as it is to like, you know, just live your own life. And then when you are a, a leader of, um, for, for God, a servant for God in that way, mm -hmm. that puts a different type of pressure on you from everybody else. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And to me, I'm like, well, that can't be healthy, you know, <laughs> to have constant people on your back like that all the time. Right? So like, how do you how have you dealt with it, it good, good, good or bad or over the years? How have you dealt with like the the pressure of, of being of, of being a pastor? That, that that's fair. I don't think I dealt with it good at all initially. I think it was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And I I think it almost ruined my marriage. Mm -hmm. Because I was kind of locked in and I was like it's kinda like just me and Jesus and then it was Lee over here and then with Lee and Brittany. And then the kids, I was kind of like, leave me alone, let me do this Jesus say. Right. And that was my response to it. But that, that was rough. That almost ended my marriage, man. And I had to get myself together. I didn't really gain perspective 
until I went to college and started taking counseling for my master's. Mm. And then so imagine sitting in class and everything they talk about, you think you are. So I'm, like, I'm, just, I'm nuts. <laughs> I'm sitting there, I'm nuts. Yeah, yeah, I probably yeah. should tap out right, right. and go and go get some a padded room with some crayons yeah, yeah, yeah. and just call it day. But every class, every issue, I felt like I had. And it wasn't until I got enough training and education to know I needed to start talking to somebody. Mm-hmm. So I had to get, get in some counseling myself to weed through it. But that pressure was overwhelming. And how long had you been? Preaching at that time before you really, you know, mm, going to school for your master's. Ten years, man. Ten years. It was over ten years because I started preaching at twenty one. I was pastoring at twenty four. And so, were you? <clears throat> this is this is an interesting conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, did you start getting? Was, was, did your counseling come inside the church, or did it come externally from psychologists or counseling? Where, where, Out, it came outside the church. So, why did you go that route? Because the because reason, I was in school. Got it. So you seen so you seen the value of counseling. Yeah. And you know, really yeah, sitting with somebody, then that's that's interesting. That is a real perspective, yeah. right? Because you know, someone like myself, the first time that I even understood the word counseling or like you know, identified that as something you know that people did, it was relationship counseling through church, mm-hmm. grief counseling through church, and just like you know, marriage counseling through church and things like that. I didn't really see the value of counseling and sitting down and talking to somebody until I began doing the work, like, like you said, like you said myself. Absolutely. But a lot of people associate counseling and getting help with people only in the, within the church. Yeah, no, 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 no. And, and see, here's, here's the funny part. Like, with, 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 uh, with Pastor Dennis, he and I, we, we've been friends the whole time. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's obviously started preaching. And as a matter of fact, whoever see this, y'all need to know Jeff Dennis is older than me. <laughs> He, he, at least 17, OG, man. he at least 17 years older than me. I just got more gray hair than him. Uh, but Jeff Dennis is older than a mother. Uh, but, uh, he is, he is, man. He is. But no, we, we were going through this stuff together. And so I was I was in school when he was formed back then. It was the African American Counseling Team, I like right. call it. Right. But I remember when he was actively putting that together, I was still in school. Okay. Because at that point, we all starting to wake up. Right. And we're like, hey man, we all have crazy. We need something in place to help people because if it were not for our faith and each other, there was a nucleus of us. We could talk to each other about anything and get truth. So that was cool. We held each other accountable, but Jeff started understanding early if we doing this, you know our members are doing it. Absolutely. And that's when we started to piece that thing together. Right. But I was in school, man, hearing this stuff, and then we started talking about being bipolar, and I was like, oh, I'm crazy. I, I'm bipolar. <laughs> to the next week, I'm schizophrenic. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was everything in the book. Right. And, and so that's what kind of made me go ahead and start talking to somebody. Yeah. And, and, my, and my counselor just happened to be at Ashland. Mm. Um, you're going to go out again put them in, 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 your, in your path, man. Uh, and his name was Dave. And Dave is the one who started talking me through it. He started talking me through David May. Um, he started talking me through it. A white cat, but but remarkably insightful. Okay. Um, and that's how I kind of started getting healthy, uh, emotionally and mentally, because I promise you, another year or two, on, on the path I was on, I don't think I would have stayed there. Yeah. Just, it was, we were doing growing apart, right? right. Just, I'm mean, let me do this, and I was throwing money at it, right? Because I was making a lot. I was working at the university, and I'm like, at the church, I'm doing good. And so, if we got mad, I fired for a cold or something. You was trying to ban yeah. it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, all right, so tell me this. Tell people why, man, why is it important to, you know, Lean on your faith in the in the midst of turmoil, but also seek some outside sources and, and, and get counseling. Why why are two why are those two important yeah. together? Yeah. Well, well, faith faith is important simply because you have to know that there's something bigger than you. Mm-hmm. There's a plan bigger than yours, mm-hmm. and you got help 
beyond your own ability right. to provide. Right. But the counseling piece doesn't work without accountability. Mm -hmm. See, so I just didn't, I couldn't just do John the counseling. I needed people like Jeff Dennis to make me accountable. Mm -hmm. Because you, you can go tell your counselor anything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's real. That, that's you real. Know. That's real. You can you can literally lie. Come on, man. Yeah, yeah, that's real. That's real. And they don't know you can blame other people. That is real. You can switch up the story. That's real. So it's also important to have people who you can be transparent with. Right. My friend Bernard Bell said this to his son. And Bernard just passed away a couple of weeks ago. But he said this to his son. You got to get some people around you who love you too much to lie to you. Mm. See, because counseling won't work if you can create this other thing in your in yourself, in your head, and all of that. There must be accountability beyond this person who only knows me therapeutically. Mm. Somebody has to know I'm in therapy. Right. Somebody has to know the stuff I'm working on. So they can help me stay away from the things right. that can pull me down this rabbit hole. Yeah. So it's not just the counseling and it's not just the faith. It's also you gotta have people you trust and who you, who you know will require you to be accountability. Uh, one was uh, uh, Jeff Dennis. The other is my biological brother, Mike. Mm -hmm. I can tell Mike anything, but he gonna hold me accountable. Mm -hmm. I'm always the preacher. I'm his little brother, mm -hmm. but he ain't playing. Right. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm his pastor too. Right. And so I can tell him anything. His thing would be like, okay, so what you going to do? Right. Yeah. So I, I think counseling is important. Faith is definitely important. But those two things, even faith without accountability don't need much. Somebody got to make you accountable to what you say and who you say you are. Now, when you get into manhood and fatherhood and being a husband like you are, the people you go home to make you accountable. <laughs> yeah, that's a fact. You see what I'm saying? That's a fact. Because the last thing you want to do is embarrass them yeah. and let them down. Right. You see, yeah. At least when you're wired the right, right. Thing. Right. 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 So, so that becomes a source of accountability as well. Yeah. But I, 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 the faith is important because you got to know it's something bigger than you. Yeah. It's something bigger than this moment. It's something bigger than what's happening to me. Right. The counseling is there because you got to get out of your own head. Because we, you know, we can tell ourselves anything and believe it. Yeah. And then the next thing is you got to have not a big circle, a tight one. One, two, three people that you are accountable to. That I, I would just rather quit doing it than disappoint them. Yeah. Yeah. And my, my parents were that for me too. That's good. Because they believed in me so much. <clears throat> I, I didn't care about disappointing the church. Man, the last thing I wanted... <laughs> was my mother or father to say, I'm ashamed of you. Right. Ah, that would rip me up. Right. So that accountability piece is, is important. Man, how much have you seen the church and just the ministry, you know, just kind of evolve and just change over the years, good good and bad? <laughs> I know, man. I'm just, <laughs> I, got, I can't get the real from you, man. You know, it's, it's only right, man. We got to get the real. Right now, I, I'm, I'm confronted with the fact that this has changed a lot. I won't say it's changed for the worse. I think people say it's changed for the worse, John, because we weren't prepared to handle it. I think if we get ourselves together and get prepared to handle it, we're going to be all right. Mm -hmm. But but church has changed a lot, man. Church, church, church has changed so much. Even with what we're dealing with, the, the faith issues and the faith matters that we're dealing with, everything from, you know, or what is love to who can get married to is it okay to drink sociably to get high because you need it for medicinal purposes these are all questions that wasn't even on the table when I started right. they wasn't even on the table right. so all of this stuff has changed drastically and I think God is still the same man we just gotta lay before him hear his heart and not allow our stuff to get in the way of what God wants but the church has changed drastically. Um, this is not the church I started preaching in. Um, these are not the rules I started preaching by. Um, so everything has changed, but I don't know if it's for the worse 
I just know it's different. So does that does that scare you, or does it yes. make you optimistic? Both. I, I'm afraid of messing up. Mm. What you mean? Well, I, you know, I was on automatic pilot for about the first twenty years. Mm. Church was church. Yeah. Church was church, and you could do what you were doing. Mm -hmm. So you know, it was on automatic pilot. And right. I got a great choir. Right. Got a great church. The people are giving. I'm preaching the best I can. The building is full. We're cruising. Right. So along comes this thing, COVID, and it <laughs> shuts everything down. And it changes everything. And so now. Overnight, too. Overnight. It ain't the same no more. And so now I got to rethink am I preaching too long? Am I not preaching long enough? Do I still need to hoop? Do I not need to hoop? Should I holler at the end? Should I not holler? I'm trying not to mess up in the season. Now I can be arrogant and say I'm just going to be me. Really? You just Because that moment, what I do for a living ain't about me just being me. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to serve the people that I'm made responsible for. So to that end, I'm afraid of messing up. So I just try to stay before the Lord so I don't mess up, at least not intentionally. And then the other part, I'm optimistic because it is new, because it can be better, because I can perhaps reach more people, which is why I'm sitting here. My son said, Dad, you got to do some stuff. You ain't getting out like you need to. Let me call uh, John to see. And so I'm grateful for you having me on because I've never done this before. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, sitting uh, a podcast. I did it one other time and it was during COVID. So I was just kind of sitting in the house and they were asking me stuff. Right. I, was, I think I'd be able to watch TV while I was doing it. <laughs> so, so this is like, this is new for me. Right. And this is real. And here's the other piece, John. This ain't going nowhere. Right. Right. We here. It ain't, we ain't going to ever Get rid of the stuff we deal with. Right. It's here. It's here to stay. Right. And that, and that, and that's dope, man. Because like you know, things like this, things like this, forms like this, platforms like this, where we can sit down and have real conversations. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And again, it's good to see, young man. Like it's it's mm -hmm. good to just see the different dynamics of it. But it's also good for people to just see men and just see people in general having organic conversations, man, and just pour, pouring into one another. You, you know what I'm saying? That was, that was the whole base of, you know, starting the platform. I love it. I love what you're doing. I, and, and even now, man, like I told you, we were talking. I, I've been very fortunate, man, as a, as a preacher, a pastor. I ain't, I ain't got no battle scars and no horror stories. God's been good. My, I always give me a bunch of great people around me. The thing that's making me nervous now is I don't have the men I need in church. They disappeared over the last five or six years. Some deaths, some moving away for jobs, you know, but they moving away. That's a panic button for me because I don't want to be the cat that has no masculine representation. Right. Right. And this is the first time in 33 years, 34 years, that's been a concern for me. So right now I'm trying to put piece together. How do I draw men back into fellowship? And I'm, I'll use my words for a second because I don't want them just in church. Right. I need them kind of, see my men were connected to me. Mm -hmm. So we, we go shopping together, we go hang out. You have a relationship with Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I, I need to rebuild that because I've lost some. And then like I said, some, six or seven of them have passed away. Um, a lot of them have moved away, and then I still got a, a good nucleus there. But I've never been the cat to wait till it was as bad as it can get right. to be concerned. You want to be prepared. Oh yeah, man. So and, and I need young men too because I'm 56. Yeah. I can't. A lot of the problems in the black church, John, is we get to this age and we look up and we've never trained anybody to take over. Mm. So I can't be 56 unless I might take over this 50. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. So now I'm also looking for the male or female who can replace me. Because I really don't. I don't want to do this till I just drop dead. Right. I'd rather be healthy of right mind 
and hand it to somebody and let them do their thing. And there's been so many pastors who go to the end, man, and there is nobody to, it's just, you know. I don't want that. Yeah. I don't want that for me. I don't want that for my family. I don't want that for the people who trust me that call me their pastor. Yeah. So that, I'm trying to sort that out now, too. That's an issue for me. Man, how do you how do you think that how do, how do you plan on doing that? Like, how do you plan on getting, you know what I'm saying, more brothers in the church and more, you know, young, young guys in the church? But I'll, even, I'll, speak, I'll speak frankly, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I dealt with, like, my own, I guess I just dealt with my own process of just, like, not connecting and not trusting mm -hmm. really, really the church. But I really do think that a lot of that had to just deal with the fact that, again, like I was telling you off camera, is that I didn't really have any, um, in a personal relationship with anybody, you know, who was in leadership in the church. So I just didn't feel connected. It just felt like a place where, you know, I, I, I understood the value of it, but as far as just being connected to it, I didn't really feel that way until, you know, I got with my now, my now wife and, you know, connected to my, my in-laws and things like that. And I was able to see like, okay, they regular people, they cool, you know, they do some of the same things I say, they talk the same way that I cool. And they, they regular people, they real. Right, you know what I'm saying. So, but I understand that 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 is a rare experience. Everybody gonna be married to a pastor's daughter, and you know they, they definitely ain't gonna have the connection to Pastor Dennis and you know my mother. Like they ain't gonna come like that. So I know that I'm blessed. You know what I'm saying. But I also understand the value of like you know brothers being connected in in that way through through the church. You know what I'm saying. So what? How do you how do you plan on doing that? It's it's for me, man. It's simple. But the hard part will be difficult. So over the last few years, I told you I was on kind of automatic pilot. Mm -hmm. And what I have to do now is come down. Mm -hmm. I got to come back down. Mm -hmm. I got to humble myself. And we got to hate. We got to watch games again. Right. And fry fish again. Right. And wash cars again. Because that's the stuff that draw me in. You gotta go to where they at. <laughs> Come on, man. So I just I gotta make time to do it. I and I and I'm I, I really am busier than I've ever been before. But what I'm doing ain't more important than drawing brothers to Christ. Right. Or what's the point? Right. So to to, to make sure that I get people in place to run that stuff, mm -hmm. and then just come back down because I'm John. I'm, I'm really good at being Kenny Paramount. I'm really good at being Kenny Paramore. And I just need to take some time to come down to be Kenny Paramore. And I think it'll take care of itself. Uh, I, I, I ain't for everybody, but the people who get me, oh, they'll be drawn to what we do. And I, I trust that. I trust that. So right now I'm trying to set people in place to take care of some things so I can be available for fellowships and hanging out with the brothers and taking trips like we used to. Cause now I gotta build it again. Yeah. And uh, so just humbling myself, coming down, not allowing my pos holding my position, and not allowing my position to hold me. Right. That makes sense. It does. Purpose. Yeah. I got. Listen, I got a couple more questions, man. Um. Speak to speak to the value. You know. Shout out to Miss Paramore. Ah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, Anytime I see Miss Perry I can always hear when she ja ja. She, she got a distinct voice. I know she, you know what I'm saying? She always give me a big hug and always show me love from day one. Her and my mom was tight. Mm -hmm. You know, speak to the value of like, you know, um, having, you know, that supportive wife and just like, you know, having the the foundation at, at the crib. And like, you know, speak to the, the value of like what she has meant to not only you, but you know, to the things that you built, the things you created, to just what you you know want to continue to do. Uh, man, so one of the most important things uh, in the ministry has been Lita. Mm -hmm. Now, Lita believed in me as a preacher before I believed in myself. She just did. She mm -hmm. saw it. She mm -hmm. got it immediately, mm -hmm. and she saw that. Keep she going. I'm just gonna turn the camera on. Keep going. Keep going. She been. She's been pouring into that that vision the whole time and I would tell anybody and I would tell them this everything that I have accomplished I have accomplished with her mm. whatever it is right. with her being by my side right. and so you know a lot of cats be like well if I didn't have her maybe I could go further 
mm, probably wouldn't be nobody. <laughs> you probably wouldn't be nobody if you didn't have her. And so Lita has been really the glue uh, and the motivation uh, for, for all of that, man. She's constant. She's constant. I've never heard her. She's never criticized me Ooh. when I was broke. Ooh. And then I, I, I've never heard her say, you need to make some Ooh. money. Ooh. Or you need to do Talk this. Man. You got to do this. She was always supporting. Now, uh, granted, I was always grinding, right. trying and working. But I've never had her talk down on me. Even when, when we were uh, on the rocks, and I was like, look at all Look at all this stuff. Look at your car in the house. She said, boy, ain't nobody asked you none of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, you did that for you. Yeah, 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 man. She broke that down, so she ain't never been on that. Um, she wanted to have a relationship with me, and she wanted us to do ministry together. Right. And, and raise our children together. And, man, she, she has really been a source of keeping me grounded mm -hmm. tonight. Uh, so I, I don't I don't believe I would have had the success I've had without Lita Perry. I'll just say that up front. Yeah. I'll be I, I would probably be an average dude. <laughs> yeah. You know, with, without that foundation and without her quietly pushing me. Yeah. She never needed to be out front. She never had to have a limelight. She didn't need none of that. Um, but she's always been there. Always been there. And you can't. And you gotta have that support as a man. Yeah. Somebody gotta believe in you at home. Oh yeah. <laughs> it man, come on. Man, listen. When I I, I, I know what you say, <laughs> man. I feel you. I, 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 I know. I know what you mean, man. Listen. When I have when I have a vision and I'm talking to Sierra about that at home. Um. Number one, I know that she gets it. Mm -hmm. I know that she can see it. But sometimes, as, as you know, the vision gets cloudy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we can't always see it, even though we may be able to feel it, but just her presence, and just a few little gems and nuggets she yeah, drops in there to let me yeah. know, like, nah, you good, just, you know, yeah. just keep keep working, you know, there's, there's things that she just says, it's like, okay, I didn't even know I needed that, but I needed that. That's a rare thing to have. Facts. <laughs> That's a rare thing to have, I'm so glad. I've been knowing Sierra all oh, <laughs> I remember the first day she came to church and her white out. I need a picture of I need a picture I remember the first day she came to church at United Baptist Church. I've been knowing her. And this man is so awesome to hear that y'all have that dynamic yeah. going. Yeah. Because I promise you, man, when, when you marry somebody, if, if, you, if, you, if you get blessed enough, to get the right person, hold on to them. Absolutely. Hold on to them. Even if it ain't always adding up, hold on to them. Because you you have the thing that you need to make it. You got a soulmate. Mm -hmm. So if you get the right person, hold on to them. Yeah. yeah. I, I was telling a young cat that I was talking to John uh, a couple months ago. He was talking to me about his wife. I said, the question is not. Is she the prettiest girl you know? Is she the smartest girl you know? Is she the is she the uh, the girl who makes the most money? The question is, is she what's best for you? Now, if you tell me she's not what's best for you, you messed up because you picked her. Right. But if she's what's best for you, you need to work this out. Right. You got to work this out. And, and, and the beauty of it is finding the person who is the best for you. Not with all that other stuff, just this person is literally what I need. I just told the cat, the first time you married, you got what you wanted. How about this time you let God give you what you need? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's real, man. So I'm proud of y'all, man. Thank I'm you. proud of y'all. I'm excited for y'all. I'm excited to see what it turns into. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate that. Listen, when's the, when's the last time your faith was tested? And how did you how did you deal with it? <laughs> Last week. <laughs> what, is you, what is you talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's, that's the real. I, I, that's the, the real. My my faith was tested two weeks ago, three weeks ago, 
when we got the news, whatever that was about Jay, mm -hmm. my faith is tested mm -hmm. in those moments. My faith was tested last week when we had to go bury one of our closest friends. Faith was tested when we buried my wife's mother. Um, it's tested all the time because the faith is real. It's tested every day. Whether it's a great test or quiz mm -hmm. or pop quiz, mm -hmm. it's tested every day, man. Faith, faith is a muscle. And you use that muscle every day. Sometimes you, you use it more than other times, but every week, every month, my faith will be tested. And I have to decide, am I going to trust him again? That's the question. Mm -hmm. See, this ain't about whether or not I'm a Christian because that definition can be played. Mm -hmm. The question is, will I trust him again? Even in this. Right. Even in this, will I trust him again? For the first time in my life, I got sick last year. Um, I had some heart trouble. Uh, uh, they call it AFib, mm -hmm. atrial fibrillation. Yeah. My heart was running away. And uh, I had to make up my mind Am I going to get depressed about this? Or am I going to do what I'm supposed to do and trust him in this? So be aware, be alert, be woke. Your faith ain't trusted every day. Your faith ain't tested every now and then. Your faith is tested every day. Every day. It's just, you know, you get used to passing the quizzes. So <laughs> the quizzes is easy. Sometimes it'll bring a bigger test of man shit. Every, every time something happens, I have to agree that he's still going to be my God and I'm still going to be a servant. Beautiful, man. Listen, Pastor Paramore, man, this, this has been wonderful, man. I appreciate you coming on. We done. Well, I got I got a couple more rapid questions, but you, we got some more games. I was going to freestyle. Oh, go ahead. No. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, it's a safe space, man. Go ahead get your bars off. Go ahead. I ain't know that was coming. Go ahead. No. I'm okay. messing with you, I'm messing with you. Okay, I'm about to say, hey, <laughs> hey, this is a good mic right here, you know what I'm saying? This ain't just for podcasting, you know, these are top of the line. You, know, you, can, you can get your stuff all right now. We got a night on make this a comedy <laughs> show. <laughs> yeah, you say you might want to reach the young cat, this might, you know what I'm saying? That will not do it. <laughs> that will not do it. Ah, uh, no, man, I, I, I appreciate you, man. I, um, I, want, I want to tell you, man, to your face, man, that I... I appreciate you, I love you, and I genuinely respect you, man, you know, for a lot of the work and a lot of the service that you're doing. Um, and, you know, man, just from, from a distance and from afar, man, you can always just see cash, man, and just see, like, okay, man, that's a good representation, you know, of something, even if you don't know what it is. And from a distance, man, you've always been that to me. So I just appreciate you, you know, be, being yourself, and I appreciate you coming to sit down and chop it up with us, man. This, this has been this has been wonderful. This is awesome. Man. Yeah, man. Thank you, man. Thank you. Listen, I got I got a couple of rapid questions I want to hit you with, man. Okay. Um, name of the show is called Live, Live Your Purpose. What What is your purpose, and how is that connected to what you're doing today? My My purpose is really teaching people to live the best life they can live mm -hmm. as a believer. That's, that's my purpose, and I've been fortunate enough to do that for over 30 years. So I, I, I've been fortunate enough to live my purpose. Okay. Yeah. What is the greatest, uh, greatest advice you've received? <laughs> the greatest advice I've ever received came from Dr. Edgar Fisher. He was my childhood pastor. And he said, son, you're going to be something. He said, as you're climbing the ladder of success, Make sure your ladder is leaning on the right building. Mm. Ain't that heavy? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. That's deep right there. Yeah. So on the flip side, what's the worst advice you ever received? You need a concubine. <laughs> Somebody told you that? On Sunday morning before I went out to preach. You need a concubine. Stop it, man. That's the worst advice I've ever oh, gotten. Oh, man. That's terrible, yeah. man. That's terrible advice, man. That's the worst advice I've, I've ever gotten. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, the <laughs> oh, that's terrible. On a Sunday morning. Before that's I walk out. getting tested every day, right? Every day. <laughs> um, what? Look, that, that one will shut you down. Right. Yeah, you want to look for the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 See? What, um, what is something that you know to be true? That nobody can, can swear to you. What is something that you know to be true? Oh, God is real. And prayer works. Mm. I know that for real, for real. Mm. 
Yeah. I know it because I've tried it in my personal space. God is real. And prayer works. I know it for sure. Yeah. Personally, yeah. I know it. Not from books, not from scripture, but I know it from my own life. Right. Yeah, I know right. it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good, man. If you, could give, if you could give people one habit or one practice that they had to practice every day, what would it be? Thinking. Mm. Thinking. Yeah, we don't think anymore. No, 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 we don't. It's too much of this, man. <laughs> we don't. We get told what to buy. Ooh. We get told what to eat. We get told what to wear. Right. We get told who we should be. Right. And we have lost the art of just sitting still Ooh. and thinking. Yeah, stillness. That's it. That's good. Yeah, that, that that's that, that that's real good, man. I like that. You last question. If you could go back and tell your 20 year old self, 1987, March 4th, the things you know today, what would you tell young, young Mr. King Paramore, man? What would you tell yourself? Spend more time with your family, mm -hmm. less time at church, and more time with the Lord. Because mm -hmm. church and the Lord ain't so yeah, nice. nice. Yeah. More time with your family. I miss some key moments of them growing up that I can't get back. So I would love to spend some more. I would get them moments back. I would spend less time at church because the stuff I thought mattered didn't matter. They'd get somebody else to mess up. And I would spend more time on my face, man, with the Lord. Because for me, here's, here's my motto now. My motto now is I want to laugh more than I cry. I want to give more than I take. And I want to love more than I hate. Mm. That's it. Say less, man. <laughs> we, 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 I ain't asking no more questions. We get out of here on that, man. That is a powerful word. Again, Pastor Paul Paramore, man, I genuinely appreciate you. Love you, man. Love Thank you as well. Thank you. Um, shout out Kenny, man. We're putting this together, man. I, I appreciate you. Listen, another episode, LYP. Peace. <laughs>